I'll start by saying a few words about what deliberative democracy is uh, before I go, move on to how it plays out in the area of climate governance at all levels, actually, from the, the local, um, and in particular, I'll say a few words about the, uh, uh, the, the global level. Um, deliberative, sorry, deliberative democracy is the most, has been the most popular topic amongst political theorists for the last uh, 10, 20 years or so. Uh, but it's not just a political theory. Uh, the study of deliberative democracy um, has now spread into uh, um, just a vast range of disciplines. Um, it also informs a reform movement worldwide um, for transforming processes of gov government. Um, and it's also got some very high profile endorsements. Um, so for example, um, Barack Obama um, in his 2006 book, The Audacity of Hope, um, has a paragraph in which he argues that the US constitutional system was actually designed to set up a deliberative democracy. Um, perhaps more ambiguously, um, Hu Jintao in his uh, farewell address um, as, as Chinese president uh, last year uh, spoke of the need for more in the way of consultative democracy in China, although uh, quite what he meant by that is unclear and the, the question of how one translates deliberative democracy into Chinese um, is itself uh, somewhat contentious. But, um, but deliberative democracy has been endorsed uh, very explicitly, uh, not uh, not necessarily by Hu Jintao, that's more ambiguous, but um, by leading figures in the hierarchy of the Chinese Communist Party who see it as a way of uh, uh, um, expanding uh, democratic participation uh, without challenging the monopoly of the Chinese Communist Party on power. Um, and as indeed, as I'll, um, I'll show later on, um, it is possible to have del deliberative democracy um, in non-electoral contexts, um, in particular in global governance. Um, so let me start. Um, then by saying a few words about what deliberative democracy is. Um, its core claim is that democratic legitimacy rests on the right opportunity and capacity of those subject to a collective decision or their representatives to participate in consequential deliberation about the content of that decision. Consequential is important, it ought to make a difference. Um, so what then is deliberation? Uh, deliberation uh, at the core of deliberation is mutual justification and reason giving on the part of participants in, in a governance setting. Um, but but it, deliberation is actually open to a variety of different forms of communication, um, including rhetoric, um, including the telling of stories, giving of testimony. Um, but the welcoming of these different forms of communication is conditional. Um, in particular, communication ought to be non-coercive, um, it should be capable of inducing reflection on the part of other participants in the deliberative setting. It should be capable of connecting particular claims based, for example, on material self-interest to more general principles uh, based on some notion of the public good. Um, and participants should ideally strive for reciprocity. And what this means in a deliberative context is making claims, uh, telling stories, giving arguments, in terms that make sense to people who do not share one's own conceptual framework. So the reaching across um, ideological divisions, uh, divisions based on uh, nationality, religion, and, and so forth. Deliberate democracy then requires deliberation to be inclusive of all affected by decisions. Deliberative governance doesn't. So we can have deliberative governance that is not necessarily uh, inclusive to the degree that uh, deliberative democracy demands. So why do we need it? When it comes to climate change, uh, I think most people would probably agree that existing governance systems don't handle climate change particularly well. That's especially true at the global level where it seems we've uh, reached impasse in the, the global, nego global negotiations under UN auspices. If we look at uh, Australia in particular, we see that climate change um, reveals many of the pathologies of unremittingly adversarial liberal democracies, um, especially when it comes to uh, mitigation, of course. Um, maybe with, in the case of adaptation, it's perhaps not so bad. Uh, the issue does often look intractable as it's processed by existing governance systems. Um, and some people have uh, recently been tempted uh, by more authoritarian possibilities, um, looking at China, for example and the possibility that the, the, the seeming ability of China to, for example, um, introduce renewable technologies um, extremely quickly. So some people uh, look at that and are tempted uh, to give up on democracy in its entirety. Uh, deliberate Democrats would say that we, can, we shouldn't do that. Um, instead, we can think about uh, how we can do democracy better. At the level of theory, there is 
actually a vast and growing literature on why deliberative governance should do better in an environmental context. And these are just some of the core claims that are made um, in the literature by, by many authors. Um, the first is that deliberation is one way of achieving coordination and integration across actors concerned with different aspects of complex problems. And this would include um, both expert actors, such as scientists, um, and lay perspectives as well. Uh, the second core claim is that deliberation brings public goods and generalizable interests to the fore. Uh, why is this? It's because in public discussion, under the conditions that uh, I specified a few moments ago, arguments based in, on, in terms of public goods and interests that are generalizable to large numbers of actors are much more persuasive than arguments based on self-interest. The political theorist David Miller refers in this context to the moralizing effects of public discussion. Um, the third claim, perhaps a bit more controversial, is that participation in deliberation induces its participants to bring to mind the interests of those who are not present in the deliberative forum. And those not present might inc even include non-human nature and future generations. Now, this is a claim made by my ANU colleague, uh, Bob Goodin. Uh, currently has less empirical support than some of these other claims. So that's perhaps a bit more sp speculative. Finally, deliberation is one way of organizing feedback on the state of social ecological systems uh, into, into governance systems. In sum, as political theorist James Meadowcroft puts it, there is a faith that deliberation will somehow bring people to their environmental senses. So those are, those are the theoretical claims made on behalf of deliberation and deliberative, deliberative governance in an environmental context. What about the evidence? Is there any evidence to support these bold claims? We can start by looking at evidence from micro forums. This is actually much more easy to generate than uh, looking at macro systems. I'll get to those in just a moment. Um, if we look at designed micro forums, um, especially those involve, involving lay citizens, we actually find a, a, a fair amount of evidence to support these, these theoretical claims, um, especially when it comes to the prioritization of public goods and the incorporation of the interests of others, be they present or not present in the deliberations. Uh, there's an, so th there's a, a huge experience now in conducting citizen forums, lay citizen forums in particular, in an environmental context. Um, I'll just give uh, what, what, I'll just talk very briefly about uh, perhaps the biggest exercise in lay citizen deliberation in the context of climate change, which was conducted in 2009. Uh, September the 26th, 2009, uh, deliberative citizen forums were organized on the same day using the same model in 38 countries around the world um, to deliberate climate change um, in the run-up to the uh, Conference of the Parties in Copenhagen later that year. This process um, called, was called Worldwide Views. It was coordinated by the Danish Board of Technology, um, but involved partners um, in, many different, in many different countries. The results in almost every case, actually not, not quite every case though, were that the citizens gathered in those forums um, supported much stronger action on the part of their, on, on, on climate change um, than their own governments were at that point prepared to support in the context of the UN negotiations. Um, in particular, participants in forums in developing countries agreed to the need for their own governments to participate in mitigation of emissions in a significant way and not just leave mitigation to the wealthier developed countries. Um, there was a follow-up worldwide views in uh, uh, 2012 on issues of biodiversity. Um, again, the same model. Um, applied the same day, in this time in 25 different countries. Um, however, there are limits to which we can extrapolate the findings from these citizen forums, these micro findings, uh, to macro systems of governance. When it comes to instances of real world governance, um, especially, uh, especially on environmental issues, uh, we can find some success stories, if we look. Um, we could also find instances of failure. 
Um, so success stories of deliberative governance, um, um, for example, um, in, there are a number of cases from uh, water governance in California. Um, so if you look for success stories, you, you can find them. Um, in terms of sort of more systematic analysis of, of, of governance systems in deliberative terms, the, the results are actually more ambiguous. Um, I referred on this slide to a recent book by uh, a Swedish political scientist, Karin Backstrand and her colleagues, um, who wrote a, a, a book called uh, Environmental Politics and Deliberative Democracy, which is actually uh, about new forms of governance, um, especially new forms of collaborative and network governance, um, mostly in a Scandinavian context, although they do take a look at uh, um, so in instances of global governance, um, for example, the clean development mechanism. Um, to cut a long story short, they find that these new forms don't seem to perform obviously better than old forms. Uh, why is that? Well, they're often compromised by their association with, with actors, both governmental and private sector actors, um, who, uh, who um, uh, as a result of entering into a, a new form of governance, um, bring with them their old points of view, their, 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 their old imperatives, um, most of which concern uh, material economic growth, uh, much more than they do, um, much more than they do um, any sort of serious concern with uh, in, environmental questions. Uh, so, the moral I would draw from this, from the Backstrand et al. analysis, um, is not that the not that deliberative governance um, necessarily fails in practice. Um, but that should be, we should be careful uh, in applying the deliberative label to any form of governance just because it looks networked and collaborative. Um, actually, none of the forms of governance that Backstrand et al. analyze uh, were consciously informed by deliberative ideals in the way they were established. Um, so, um, what can we say about what works and what doesn't in, in the light of this, this sort of analysis? Um, what I would say is that uh, these forms of governance that Backstrand et al. analyze are collaborative. Um, they often work along consensual lines. But what they miss is the contestatory aspect of deliberative democracy, which is, which is actually crucial. Um, I could go into um, sort of great detail on the comparative environmental history of different, different countries in these terms. Um, co-authored a book with um, David Schlossberg and several other co-authors uh, 10 years ago called Green States and Social Movements, which does analyze the history of environmental governance um, in different states. Um, and one of the conclusions from that is that positive performance doesn't just require consensual governance, it also requires contestation. Uh, where does contestation come from? Uh, well, typically, the, the typical source is a lively oppositional public sphere of some sort. Um, and we uh, look at the history of Germany in particular in that light. And that's one reason why D Germany has proved to be, um, um, in, in, in some ways, in the, in the forefront of um, successful environmental governance. Um, so, what is, so what I would suggest then is that in deliberative governance, we don't just need moments of consensus and collaboration. We also need moments of contestation. Now, consensus... Um, Actually, um, just for the sake of, um, of keeping, keeping things to time, um, I, I won't talk about the other things that we should look for. I'll just emphasize for the moment um, the, the importance of moments of contestation as well as moments of consensus and collaboration in deliberative systems. Um, consensus, in turn, is facilitated by positive sum discourses such as ecological modernization, uh, which emphasizes that pollution prevention pays to use the... Uh, uh, the, the, the slogan that's often associated with it. Um, contestation, in contrast, um, features more radical discourses, um, such as uh, uh, climate justice. So in deliberative systems, we need to look for ways of productively combining moments of consensus and moments of contestation. We can apply this principle, I think, to deliberative governance at any level, from the local to the global. Uh, most of the work that I've been doing lately has actually been on the lo the globe, at the global level. Um, I've been working um, on a book called uh, Democratizing Global Climate Governance with uh, Hayley Stevenson, now at the University of Sheffield in the UK. 
Um, and there we look at global governance in its entirety and try to analyze it in deliberative terms. Uh, ideally, in global, global governance of, of climate change, in a deliberative light, we would like to see the productive coexistence of these moments of consensus and moments of contestation. Um, but what we see instead is often, well, we, we certainly see a large amount of activity um, and a large amount, certainly a large amount of civil society activity. Um, but what we don't generally see is, is much in the way of engagement across, uh, across different discourses. Um, and so, the con so contestation such as it is doesn't prove to be um, very productive. Um, we often see deliberative enclaves dominated by a particular discourse um, which doesn't reach other enclaves, doesn't necessarily reach the, uh, the more formally empowered parts of the, of the, of the UN negotiation process. Um, so this, this is one particular enclave. This is uh, Climber Forum 09, which was um, organized as a parallel civil society forum to the uh, 2009 Conference of the Parties in, in Copenhagen. Um, and dominated by discourses of climate just, radical discourses of climate justice, um, other kinds of green radicalism, um, but didn't, didn't, so didn't really sort of reach out beyond that. Um, this is another enclave that was held in Copenhagen uh, earlier in the year, um, the World Business Summit on Climate Change, um, dominated by much more moderate discourses of sustainability, um, ecological modernization, um, but, more, but green radicalism, climate justice, et cetera, were not present. Um, and these different sorts of forums um, very rarely reach each other. There is very little in the way of communication across them. In other words, they don't, they're not parts of an effective deliberative system, um, let alone um, making effective connections to what goes on in the more formal negotiations. Um, Stevenson and I um, don't just look at the UNFCCC process, um, we also look at emerging forms of networked governance, uh, which have uh, which have, which certainly when it comes to climate change, um, have mushroomed in recent years. There's been a real proliferation of different sorts of governance arrangements, which um, sometimes exist in loose association with the UN process, sometimes completely divorced from it, where the basic idea um, is, for is for different actors to somehow collaborate, um, in, uh, especially when in, in mitigation initiatives. Um, so. Uh, for example, we've looked at the, um, the Clean Technology Fund set up by the World Bank and other multilateral development banks in 2008. Um, the Clean Technology Initiative Private Financing Advisory Network, which was founded in 2006 as a public-private partnership. Um, we looked at the Verified Carbon Standard, which is a purely private initiative, um, involves a certification of, um, um, of, of, of offsets in particular, um, established in 2006. Um, again, to cut a long story sh very short, these initiatives in collaborative governance do have some deliberative promise. Network governance do have some deliberative promise. Um, however, their inclusion is limited. Um, basically, they privilege the participation of actors who are committed to maximizing the flow of investments in mitigation projects. Um, they are dominated by a very moderate sustainability discourse. Um, often, the investments that, uh, the, these, that, are, that are yielded by these, by these networks um, turn out to be very questionable in their effects, um, and in some cases actually have quite negative environmental consequences, um, especially at the local level, and also have um, very negative consequences um, when it comes to the, um, the livelihoods of, uh, of, uh, of, of people, for example, who, um, uh, uh, who depend on forests for their livelihood, um, but are affected by uh, um, offset schemes that involve the, um, the, the planting of trees. Um, in deliberative terms, these forms of network governance, these new forms of governance, um, are often low visibility. Um, they, gen they tend to be ignored by civil society. Uh, the, the, the vast amount of civil society activity that goes on in the global government around the global governance of climate change is all centered on the UN negotiations. And so these, all these emerging new forms are generally um, ignored by civil society actors. Um, so what does that mean? It means that, this, that, that you tend to have a low visibility process. It's dominated by um, collaboration and consensus, but it doesn't have the moments of contestation, which I suggested earlier were vital um, in any deliberative system. Um, now, 
uh, civil society organizations might argue that they have limited resources, uh, that they're, uh, that it'll be perhaps asking too much of them to participate um, in the myriad forms of uh, networked and collaborative governance that now seem to be emerging in the global system for the governance of climate change. Um, and that, that would be, that would be uh, perhaps a fair comment. Um, so in deliberative system terms, it, we, we might, what we might need to figure out is ways of better linking um, all the activity, the contestatory activity that goes on um, in the public space, sorry, in the public spheres associated um, with the UN negotiations, but somehow trying to figure out how to link that um, to not just what goes on in formal negotiations, um, but also what goes on uh, in all these, these various um, collaborative networked governance initiatives that I've, that I've, that I've mentioned. Okay, um, so the search for more effective deliberative systems goes on. Um, the, uh, yeah, so currently when it comes to the global governance of climate change, I think what we see is a deliberative system in considerable disrepair. Um, what I've argued is that deliberative governance is not necessarily going to be the key to making it work better. Um, but it is one piece of the puzzle. Um, and certainly if the, the, the theoretical claims of deliberative democracy in environmental context uh, have any merit, then we really do need to sort of fig try and figure out ways of making the global governance of climate change, and indeed governance of climate change at all levels, uh, more deliberative than it currently is. Okay, so I'll finish there. I'll start by saying a few words about what deliberative democracy is uh, before I go, move on to how it plays out in the area of climate governance at all levels, actually, from the, the local, um, and, and in particular, I'll say a few words about the, uh, uh, the, the global level. Um, deliberative, sorry, deliberative democracy is the most, has been the most popular topic amongst political theorists for the last uh, 10, 20 years or so. Uh, but it's not just a political theory. Uh, the study of deliberative democracy um, has now spread into uh, um, just a vast range of disciplines. Um, it other participants in the deliberative setting. It should be capable of connecting particular claims based, for example, on material self-interest to more general principles uh, based on some notion of the public good. Um, and participants should ideally strive for reciprocity. And what this means in a deliberative context is making claims, uh, telling stories, giving arguments, in terms that make sense to people who do not share one's own conceptual framework. So the reaching across um, ideological divisions, uh, divisions based on uh, nationality, religion, and, and so forth. Deliberate democracy then requires deliberation to be included. But deliberate democracy has been endorsed uh, very explicitly, uh, not, uh, not necessarily by Hu Jintao, that's more ambiguous, but. Um, by leading figures in the hierarchy of the Chinese Communist Party, who see it as a way of uh, uh, um, expanding uh, democratic participation uh, without challenging the monopoly of the Chinese Communist Party on power. Um, and as indeed, as I'll, um, I'll show later on, um, it is possible to have del deliberative democracy um, in non-electoral contexts, um, in particular in global governance. Um, so let me start um, then by saying a few words about what deliberative democracy is. Um, its core claim is that democratic legitimacy rests on the right opportunity and capacity of those subject to a collective decision or their representatives to participate in consequential deliberation about the content of that decision. Consequential is important. It ought to make a difference. Um, so what then is deliberation? Uh, deliberation, uh, at the core of deliberation is mutual justification and reason giving on the part of participants in, in a governance setting. Um, but but it, deliberation is actually open to a variety of different forms of communication, um, including rhetoric, um, including the telling of stories, giving of testimony. Um, but the welcoming of these different forms of communication is conditional. Um, in particular, communication ought to be non-coercive, 
Um, it should be capable of inducing reflection on the part of... also informs a reform movement worldwide um, for transforming processes of gov government. Um, and it's also got some very high-profile endorsements. Um, so, for example, um, Barack Obama, um, in his 2006 book, The Audacity of Hope, um, has a paragraph in which he argues that the US constitutional system was actually designed to set up a deliberative democracy. Um, perhaps more ambiguously, um, Hu Jintao, in his uh, farewell address um, as, as Chinese president uh, last year, uh, spoke of the need for more in the way of consultative democracy in China, although uh, quite what he meant by that is unclear, and the, the question of how one translates deliberative democracy into Chinese um, is itself uh, somewhat contentious. But um, 